Welcome to the Seward Park Audubon Center. My name is Ed Dominguez, the lead naturalist, and I'd like to share with you this evening some good ideas about drawing birds into your yard with native plants. Um, we're coming to you from the Seward Park Audubon Center, the Anlin Arts Memorial Library. Our program will be, and as you can see in our library, we have some of the smartest ducks in Western Washington. Anytime you drop by the center, you'll see these ducks up on these shelves, hard at work studying and learning everything about the natural world. This presentation is also going to be on YouTube Live. You can join us there. Just look for the Seward Park Audubon channel on YouTube. At the end of the presentation, I will be taking questions and answers. If you have a question presentation, please uh, post it in the question box on the bottom of your screen at any time, and we will have that in there. And hopefully I'll have some kind of answer that makes somewhat of some sense. Many of us have thought about bringing birds into our yard, and but maybe you're new to our area and aren't sure what birds are here, how you can get them to your yard, all of that will be answered this evening. So I think we're gonna wait just a few minutes for make sure everyone gets logged in. And then uh, in just a couple minutes, we will be starting. But you are in the right place if you're here for birds and native plants. And uh, we will be starting, starting very shortly. Welcome. I'd like to start this evening in just a moment. The Coast Salish peoples. They're the original stewards of these lands. And I wanna pay homage and respect to them as the original conservationists of this place we now call home. And the particular Coast Salish the Duwamish people that were here on Lake Washington were known as the, the lake people, the Hachu Abish. And the more I've studied the uh, natural history of this area, the more I've come to learn about how they managed this area to be in harmony with it, harvesting from the waters, harvesting from the plants, from the seeds, from the flowers, from the roots, and from the animals that live here. So it's with great respect that I pay tribute to the Coast Salish people, the Hachuabish, the Lake people of Lake Washington. Plants and birds at your home. We're starting to transition into the fall season and fall for many people is a time for gardening, fall gardening. Uh, getting plants ready for the garden and drop 
a great variety of species to come and visit your yard, which will give you great entertainment and pleasure, and also will do a lot for the birds, as we will see. Our present part is going to be talking about if you're new to our area and you're just setting up your home or your apartment, or you've never thought about having birds where you live, I wanna talk about some basics about how you can draw birds into your yard. The basics of bird feeders, water, what birds like and what will bring them into your yard. Part two, I wanna talk about the native plants that are going to be especially attractive to birds and bring them into your yard and how to use your yard, whether it's a small yard or a big yard or a big field and landscape it in such a way to, to maximize the amount of bird attention that you get for birds coming in and utilizing your space as a very healthy hunting ground for them. How about how to know where birds might be nesting and how to do your gardening and restoration work with an eye to bird safety during nesting season. And part three, we'll be talking about some of the birds, giving you close up views of them that you might have in your yard and a little bit about those birds. And then lastly, we'll have a question and answer period. And hopefully I can come up with some answers to your questions. So growing wilder, native plants and birds at your home. So so how can I turn there? And this is a Wilson's warbler, a beautiful lemon colored bird with a black cap that flies 4,000 miles from Northern South America every May to spend the summer with us. And right now the Wilson's warblers are stocking up on food and getting ready to head back for that 4,000 mile journey back to Northern South America because they've raised their young, their young have fledged. And while the young are still feeding and fattening up their bodies, the adults tend to make the trip first. So within the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have these warblers making a long and for some of them a perilous journey. We want to have them in our yard and we want to give them the benefits of good food, good water and good habitat as they're looking to raise the next generation of warblers. Establishing a feeding station in your yard, whether your yard is big or small, whether you have only a deck in a condo or an apartment or maybe just a front porch, you can draw birds to your yard. So you can see in the photo here, it's just a small backyard. There's a beautiful wing birds. And then you can see there's a little uh, iron shepherd's hook tree with several different feeders on it. Tube feeders that are filled with seed. And you can also see a hummingbird feeder. So to attract birds to your yard, black oil sunflower seed is a great way to bring the, uh, the largest variety of species into your yard. Suet, another great method of bringing yards in. It does particularly well during the fall, winter, and spring months. Peanuts, many birds enjoy peanuts, our Stellar's jays and our uh, California scrub jays especially. Niger, a very thin seed that's sometimes called thistle, it isn't really a thistle, and then hummingbird nectar. So five categories of bird feed, you don't have to use all five, you can only do a hummingbird feeder if your space is limited and you don't want seed, but let me expound a little bit about each of these food sources and how they'll help birds come to you. Let's start with black oil sunflower. It is a very rich, high protein, high fat food that draws in a large number of bird species. Now, if you buy a, a sack of bird food from a large chain store, it may very well be a blend that's been mixed for birds all around the nation. And what birds go for on the East Coast or in the middle of our continent aren't, isn't necessarily what birds will like here in the West. Black oil sunflower without any other, any other seeds or additives is the one that will draw in a great number of species, gives them a great healthy diet. And black oil sunflower has very thin shells and it's easy to crack open for some birds that have smaller beaks. Striped sunflower, another food alternative, has thick and heavy shells. And where finches can crack those open quite easily, birds with smaller beaks, such as a chickadee, might have a little more trouble with it. They're usually done in a tube feeder, and you can see here this particular so 
square black cap chickadee. Seed is in the inside tube where it's safe from marauding squirrels. The chickadee can very handily perch on the outer cage, put its head right in and pick out just the most delectable seed that it likes. And when you watch them at the feeder, they are very choosy. They'll pick the richest, plumpest seed and leave the other ones for later. Squirrels can climb on that outer green cage but they can't get their paws or their mouth inside to get to the seed. And if a squirrel can get to your seed, they'll drain your feeder in a half a day. So a squirrel proof feeder is good for keeping the seed for the birds. And you can put out some old ears of corn that you can buy that squirrels will love. And that'll keep them happy too. So it is rendered beef fat. It has many times additives such as sunflower seeds or insect bits or berry bits. It will draw a great variety of species to your yard as well. And you can see here we have the big and the small. We have the pileated woodpecker who's hanging upside down as they're so adept at doing. And the beautiful chestnut back chickadee both sharing the same feeder. Suet is a, again a high fat uh, Protein rich if it's added, if it has additives of nuts that will keep the birds strong and healthy, particularly during the winter months. In the summer, I usually take my suet feeder in because the suet can melt and we all know the kind of hot weather we've been having. And if it does start to melt, it can get on the bird's breast feathers and soil them, which is not good for the birds in terms of keeping their thermal regulation, their body temperature steady. So fall, winter, and spring, up until when the weather gets hot in June, suet is a great source for food. It's also easy, no muss, no fuss. You put a suet cake in a feeder, and you're off and running. Gold goldfinch, a beautiful yellow bird with black wings and a black cap, particularly likes a seed called Niger. Niger is a seed that comes from a plant in India and is very slender and thin, and goldfinches just love it. Niger, though, is rather volatile. You want to change your seed out every 30 days, every month, if the, the finches don't clean it out because the oils can go rancid quite fit quickly. Also, you want to keep the Niger oil intact. If it's hot weather and the Niger dries completely, you're going to have to throw it out because the, uh, the goldfinches won't want to have anything to do with it. I want to say in our area, there are goldfinches, but they're they tend to be very localized in their populations. I live just maybe two and a half miles south of the Montlake Cut, where the Seattle or where the Washington Park Arboretum is located, and I put Niger feeders out several times, and only once did I get a goldfinch to come in, and it didn't come back. Just two and a half miles to the north of me, out on Foster Island on the Montlake Cut, goldfinches everywhere in the wetlands. So. There are goldfinches around. You can try Niger and you might get lucky and get them coming into your yard. Um, I wasn't so lucky, but they're such a beautiful bird. It's always worth taking a chance. And once again, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the question box and we will get around to seeing if I can answer those at the end. So don't hold back. And our hummingbirds. If you're gonna put only one type of feeder out, I would really recommend put out a hummingbird feeder. We have a year round resident hummingbird called the Anna's hummingbird. And these birds are a joy to watch. The males have a beautiful red head and what's called a gorget named after the part of suits of armor that the Knights of old wore, kind of a, a chain mail around their neck to protect them from cuts from lances and spears. Well, the hummingbird's gorget is all about showing off color and warding off other males and attracting females. And for us, the aesthetic beauty of a hummingbird is amazing. Now you can have hummingbird feeders up year round, but especially in fall and winter and spring, when the weather's cold, the hummingbirds will really appreciate this. You know, a little hummingbird's heart, even when it's at rest is beating a hundred little mighty mites keep from freezing to death, they go into a mini hibernation. Every night, the hummingbird's respiration and heartbeat drops way, way down into the 20s for the heart rate. Their body temperature drops down to not much more above the ambient temperature outside, 
and that's how they survive. But in order to go out and search for food during winter days, days, they have to jump to a great way, a super spot to come in, drink that nectar, that sugar water, gets its metabolism jump started. It'll come back to your station. That it will also go up. So they're out foraging for protein, but they'll come back to your, uh, your feeder for their uh, supply of sugar water. It's very easy to keep a hunt. Hummingbird feeder, H pure cane sugar and water. Four parts water, one part white sugar. Bring the water to a as it comes to a boil, stir in. in the sugar so it doesn't stick the heat. When it's cool, put it in your hummingbird feeder and put it out there. In the summer months, when the, the weather has been warm as it is, you want to change, refill your hummingbird feeders every week and clean them because uh, the sugar water in there can start to go bad. But during the winter, that's not nearly as much of a problem and your hummingbirds will really appreciate it. Then have watch it sound where we have a fairly moderate winter climate. We do get some days where the temperatures drop down into the 20s and birds need water. So if you can put a dish out with water in it, birds will drink in it, they'll splash in it in the warmer weather months. If you can have running water, like the example I have here of a commercially available little drip spigot that can put into a bird bath, they love running water. When you have a dish out, you can, it can be as simple as a pie pan and put a few little rocks in it so the birds can stand on the rocks in the water and get their drink there rather than try to negotiate the steep sides of a pan. So water is very important, especially in winter when it's freezes, there's not a lot of open water available. If you have some water in your yard, the birds will appreciate it. Now on to part two of our presentation. If you're working in your yard and don't all of us have to do that, and you have an area that looks like on the left side of our example, maybe an area that's overrun with some weedy invasives like, oh, English ivy, English holly, Himalayan blackberry. Uh, a great photographer and advocate of native plants, um, you're going to have to do some yard work. The question is, how can I safely restore an, an area with weedy invasives? Well, this is a picture of uh, an area just a couple of blocks from my house in uh, the Madrona neighborhood of Seattle. It's It's called the Harrison Ridge Green Ivy and Planting Native Plants, and they've been doing a super job. So here's a view of their work. You can see this is a late winter, early spring shot, so many of the deciduous plants don't have their leaves yet. So you come into a restoration area. Just wait for four minutes. When you move into an area, all of the birds recognize you as a, a foreign creature coming in. And all birds are very, very, very aware that, that each day is priority one for birds. So they may take cover. They'll certainly give alarm calls, which usually sound like sharp chip notes. Tohees will sound very much like a cat. You'll think, is there a cat in here? No, it's actually a bird. After you kind of blend in with the, with the environment. The birds will recognize after a few minutes, okay, nobody's been eaten, nobody's been attacked. We can go back to being birds and doing what we need to do, usually looking for food. So just come into the area that you're gonna do your gardening in, wait a few minutes and see what goes on. Watch what the birds are doing. If it's spring, like this picture here, are you seeing birds flying to and from a specific area, like low under some shrubs? with nest material, little bits of grass or twigs. 
that's an area that you might want to back away from and do some restoration on a little later in the year. Are birds moving to and from a specific location looking for food, or could it be that they're scouting for a nest area? If it's later in the spring, can you hear the peeping of baby birds that make a delightful little cheep sound? Most species of birds, it's some sort of a, a rapid peeping sound. Just watch for what the birds are doing. Become part of the environment and you'll find out what the birds are doing in your yard, what areas they're utilizing and how, and that can give you the next step as to what do I do in terms of my spring gardening? When you're doing plantings, another Mark Turner from his yard, use native plants whenever possible. But you don't have to be all natives. In my yard, my wife and I have a variety of natives and non-native plants that have nectar, nectar rich sources, beautiful blossoms, lots of we had a big ice sheet over our heads here in Puget Sound that retreated between 11 and 12,000 years ago. In fact, at its height, the ice was 3,000 feet over our heads here in Seattle. That means the top of the ice, uh, ice field was the elevation of Snoqualmie Pass. So that's a mind bender. When that ice retreated, there were braided outwash streams that looked like chocolate milk flowing out of the out of the base of the ice field, heavily laden with glacial silt that was made, makes it look chocolate like. And the ground is barren. Nothing has been growing there. But to the south of us, south of Olympia, there were plants growing. Glaciers didn't make it that far south. So you have insects that are active on those plants that get blown by the wind up to the foot of the retreating uh, ice field, or they come up to drink from these braided outwash streams. When they come up to do that, guess what likes to eat insects? Birds. So the birds come up to feed on the insects. The birds have been feeding many times on seeds and berries further south, and when they eat, they poop. And you have the first plants, the pioneer plants that start to grow, at the base of the retreating toe of the ice sheet. So those insects have had between 11 and 12,000 years of coevolution, meaning that they know if I lay my eggs on this particular plant, my larvae are gonna have the best chance for survival to become adults and propagate the species. So they keep coming to those particular plants again and again. The plants that were growing to the south of us and are native or endemic to our region. And birds depend on insects, the insects depend on native plants. So if you put native plants in your garden, you're already jumping way ahead in terms of attracting birds to your yard because the insects will come for those plants and the birds will come for the insects. But as I mentioned, feel free to mix non-natives at the same time. Because there are many plants, but they have Beautiful blossoms are great nectar and pollen sources for pollinators. And when they go to seed, um, their birds will utilize those. And we don't have to be too worried about invasive plants taking over. So for example, in Mark's picture here, we have Western serviceberry, a native shrub. We have Pacific nine bark, which is another native shrub, but he also has grape hyacinth. That's a great pollinating flower and has a beautiful fragrance. And he has blue cloud geranium, not a native plant, but has great pollinating uh, uh, attributes for insects and birds. So you can do a mix. Now, living in Seattle, almost everything is on a hill. And you've discovered that if you've lived here for a while, if you're new to the area, all this glacial retreat of ice has left series of hills and troughs and ridges. So you've got a lot of soil and a lot of it is glacial debris that's not particularly stable. It can get slough off, it's, it can be very clayish. And so holding hillsides back is important and our native plants do a great job of doing it. Uh, this particular example is taken from the Leshi Natural Area, which is right above Leshi Beach. It's in a forested area. And let's take a look at the native plants that they use there as it's part of their restoration and will work great in your yard. Evergreen Huckleberry, a beautiful plant that has dark green leaves all year round, 
beautiful tasty berries. Right now, our evergreen huckleberries here at Seward Park are ripe, so they're a great snack for humans as well as birds and all other creatures that love to eat berries, and who doesn't? Mammals and birds alike. In the spring, it has beautiful flowers that pollinators and hummingbirds enjoy as well, so it's a year-round uh, asset for the natural world. Bleeding heart, Dicentra famosa, one of our uh, native plants that has a beautiful pink flower that's heart-shaped. Great plant for pollinators. They love mason bees. Hummingbirds will also go for bleeding heart, and it forms a nice mat that will hold the soil back. Thimbleberry, one of our native uh, raspberries, has a six-petaled white flower that, again, pollinating insects and birds love. And then a beautiful sweet berry, one of my favorites that you can enjoy. In June and July, this is a tree that's evergreen. It's one of our, you know, uh, evergreen uh, broadleaf trees and has beautiful cone spikes of creamy yellow red flower. in the spring again right now starting to turn from green to red and an added bonus is madrona berries are high in sugar and after we get the first frost or two in november the sugar ferments and guess what the birds do they tie one on they're once a year bender they'll be eating these madrona berries as well as many other red berry shrubs we have and um, they get intoxicated and uh, as I like to say, if they could put a lampshade on their head, they would do it. I was falling out of the trees and landing on the ground like, oh, what happened? Or birds walking around, just falling, you know, their inhibitions have been lowered. And so acting in very non-characteristic behavioral ways, um, they're having a good time and It's a lot of fun to watch it's that does a great job of, of holding the ground back is evergreen and uh, is a beautiful contrast to deciduous uh, perennials you may have in your yard. And then Oregon grape, which also has great yellow flowers in the spring, important for pollinators, tasty purple berries that are ripening right about now that you can make jam out of, you can make uh, liqueur out of them, and uh, they're nice right off of the plant itself. So tall Oregon grape. So some examples of plants that if you have a hillside and you're thinking, what can I put here that will help you with management of the, 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 the structure of your, of your land, the hillside, but yet provide great food for birds. All right, let's take a look at this. We have a hill. So here are the Madrona woods. It's round and foreground. Bowl. We have a false Solomon seal in the foreground. You can see some blue forget me nots. And then in the back, you can see the yellow flowers of the tall Oregon grape that I mentioned earlier. Double flowers are loved by pollinators. Hummingbirds love them. And uh, the berries are great for us to eat. But as you approach an area like this in spring and you're thinking, I want to do some gardening, where might I have to watch to see if there might be a bird nesting there? Because I don't want to disturb things. Could there be a nest here? How about here? How about up here? I think you probably know the answer. Birds nest in all areas. They nest on the forest floor or your yard ground of, of, your, of your garden. They nest in the understory and they nest high up in the canopy. So take, let's take a little closer look at bird nesting areas and what they like. Many birds will build cup-shaped branches Quep shaped nests made from twigs and branches of trees. You can see one up here. This is in the Union Bay Natural Area, also known as the Montlake Field next to the University of Washington campus. These uh, nests can be anywhere from five to 25 feet off the ground like this one here, but many raptors such as eagles will build their nests over a hundred feet off the ground. So these cup shaped nests, and this one happens to be a cooper's hawk nest. And this cooper's hawk fledged uh, several young out of the nest this year. So look up and you might see an old nest from last year that may be used again the following year. 
In the understory, willow thickets and similar shrubs can provide great camouflage. This shot was also taken in early April when I was out in the Union Bay Natural Area. It's a big willow thicket. Is this thicket containing a nest? Let's take a closer look. Aha, when you look inside an American robin with nest material. This is a Fraser Photinia right in the planting strip outside of my house. I looked up one day and there, my Fotinia bush. So I got to have the pleasure of listening to the young peep as after they hatched and watched the adults bringing them food. And then they fledged and went on to disseminate through the area. You know, sometimes you may not have a bird, but look around. Yeah, we can trust them too. Uh, anybody's complaining about the quality of some of the other bushes. Mini birds are cavity nesters. They don't build cup-shaped nests. This includes uh, chickadees, nuthatches, creepers, woodpeckers, and of course, special to me, our owls. This is in the Yesler Swamp. This is a black cottonwood that had uh, broken off and was dangling precariously. Uh, so uh, University of Washington Horticulture uh, sawed it off, but that doesn't mean the tree, the stump isn't useful. This was a black capped chickadee nest cavity. And I delighted this spring in watching the chickadee come in and out of this nest, carrying pussy willow fuzz, little bits of twigs, bits of moss and lichens to line the nest. And it was a great pleasure just to sit and watch. So nests can take many different forms. Some nests are not so obvious, such as in the bark flake gaps on trees. This is a Douglas fir. You can notice that some of the bark has got fire scars on it. Douglas fir is a very fire resistant tree because on big trees, the bark can be a foot thick, which protects the cambium layer in the wood from the heat of the fire, unless it's a conflagration, like we've been, see we've been seeing to seeming to have all through the West for the past several years. But as that bark flakes away, it can be home to a nest. In this case, a bird called the brown creeper. And there's the brown creeper himself, a beautiful bird about three inches long that has very stiff tail feathers that allow it to brace itself against the trunk of the tree and work its way straight up the trunk. You might notice on the, the bird's foot, the creeper's foot, there are three front toes, but look at that big back toe. It's called a hallux and it can grip kind of like a a logger with a, with a choke and with its long curved bill, probe the nooks and crannies of that bark, looking for spider eggs, spiders, insect larvae, little worms, insect eggs, and they just groom the trees, cleaning them off. This tree, English hawthorn, a crotagus, has a dark-eyed junco nest right down where the, the tree is split from the and down at the base which is just about a foot off the ground right in front of my house dark-eyed juncos built a nest you might not think of that as being a nest area but now if you look around and watch in the spring you'll see again is in Yesler Swamp and the top has been broken out of it and at first it didn't draw my attention but then when I looked closer I saw there was a cavity down where that top had broken off and lo and And behold, a black chickadee was like the chickadees a little further away we're doing with that black cottonwood nest, bringing in pussy willow fluff, mosses, lichens, leaves to pad the nest down in there for their young. The area that's been undergoing restoration, in other words, pulling up blackberries, English ivy, and planting with native plants.
What we do, then the best deal around, so they make kind of a cross hatch, like a layer that will hold the blackberry clippings or the ivy clippings off the ground. Because sometimes when they touch the ground, they can start to extend little root nodules and they'll take root uh, and just you know do exactly what you don't want them to do. But if you put some branches down, or if you have a pallet, a wood pallet, something to put the debris on, Of the, of the invasive so a couple of years to make sure the plants are thoroughly dead and then you can disseminate them for mulch on your in your garden or in your restoration. area and they will provide but you want to keep them off of the ground for a couple of years if it's springtime though you want to make check and make sure because sometimes insects will use these uh, in Invasive rafts as nests or stop, look, listen, become part of the environment before you dismantle. And most of the time, the birds will take more natural areas for their nesting spring. But always check it out before you do. Just some tips about using native plants and effective gardening in your area, whether your garden is large or small. So let's move on to a ruby crown kinglet. Ruby crown kinglets are in the genus Regulus, which means, you know, the small king, the tiny king. So and he is a very imperious little bird. They have a little bit of a white eye ring, a couple of faint wing bars that are white, not too dramatic. But when the males of the ruby crown kinglets feel like they need to show their stuff, like to another male that might be getting too close, or to call in the females to give them a little pizzazz, they can erect these scarlet red feathers on their head and then flatten them down and you don't even know it was there. Many times you'll see that, and I still, having watched them for decades, will wanna rub my eyes like, did I just see that? It's pretty amazing. And the picture I have here doesn't do justice to the intensity in the brilliance of that scarlet red. So crown kinglets will come they because plants will attract aphids or lace wings or scale or you know insects the, from the, the order homoptera that we tend to think about as uh, and I have a black lace in my yard and every spring aphids try to get on it. And so, you know, I, I there and keep picking them off until after about three weeks, you know, I don't have to worry about them anymore. But in larger shrubs, it's okay if you have uh, a big hazelnut that has some aphids on it because birds like the ruby crown kinglet will help take care of those. They'll clean and preen and groom that tree and pick the aphids off and get themselves some high quality protein. So they love native plants and they love suet. I've already mentioned the chickadees a few times. We're lucky enough to have two chickadees here in our area in Western Washington, the black cap chickadee, the familiar bird that gives its alarm call, chickadee dee 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 dee, and the chestnut back chickadee that looks very similar, but take a look at that beautiful color that it has on its back, on its flanks, and on the above its tail. This bird, the, the chestnut back chickadee, tends to like things a little more woodsy, but I live right in a neighborhood in Madrona, and I've got them coming into my yard because they love black oil sunflower seeds and suet. So it's nice to see both chickadees. And, you know, one of the, my great axioms of the natural world is, is that everything is smarter than we think it is. Did you know that chickadees, this time of year, as we're moving from summer to fall, grow their brains by one third their brain masts and size. How would you like to grow your brain by a third? Man, think of how smart we all could be. Chickadees do it naturally every year. And it's the part of brain cells that are in the hippocampus, part of the brain that deals with memory and location. Because these chickadees are starting to store away in your yard, not only are they coming and eating it now, but they're taking some of those seeds 
and cashing them away. Where the thousands of caches, the brains of chickadees expand by a third with all of this memory. Now, brain mass can be heavy. And when you're a bird, you're always thinking weight to lift ratio. So when that part of the bird's brain expands, there are other parts that shrink because they aren't necessary. But in the spring, the parts of the brain dealing with seed cache memory spots will shrink. And many of these birds' brains will expand to recognize if they're a migratory bird, where their particular area where they've come and hatch themselves and where they've been raising their young is, even if they're migrating from as far away as 3,000 and 4,000 miles, they can remember the exact location where they are going to go to breed. And with the males of songbird species, amazingly enough, they can remember multitudes of other males' bird songs. Why? Conspecific bird songs, if the male, one male knows the other bird's songs, he'll recognize that that's that male's territory. He's heard the slight variation on the bird song before, and this male over here, his slight variation. The end result is you have less territorial battles and less fighting means less chance for injury and more chance for birds to spend their time courting and bringing in the females and building nests and feeding their young. So the brains change in these songbirds, particularly in chickadees, and the more you learn about it, the more just absolutely amazing it is what these birds can do. House finches. Finches are slender birds, generally about four inches, five inches long. House finch has this little bread band right above the tail. And take a look at that thick beak, that thick conical beak is very good at cracking open seeds. So if for some reason uh, you have striped sunflowers at your feeder or in my neighborhood, a lot of people grow sunflowers out on the parking strips between their house and the street, house finches can take great advantage of that because that thick bill will crack those seeds open. These guys will come to your uh, feeder uh, in great numbers. And the funny thing is, is that whereas chickadees, when they come to your feeder, will come in, pick that choice seed that I mentioned earlier, and then fly off to a branch to break open the seed and eat it. The house finch will come and just hang out on your feeder and sit there and eat away to his heart's content until finally the other birds that are waiting their turn will come in and, okay, fella, you're, you're hoarding up the... The, uh, the cafeteria here, move on and they'll chase him off. So it's fun to watch the bird, different bird species, the different feeding behaviors they have and how they interact with one another, especially when a house finch has been getting a little bit too greedy. The pine siskin, a siskin is a form of a finch. You can see it has kind of the finch body, kind of slender, kind of a striped breast, but look at the beak of the pine siskin. It's not that thick conical seed biting beak, it's a narrower beak. So pine siskins very much appreciate black oil sunflower seeds because as we learned earlier in this presentation, they're much easier to crack. They will also love suet. Another way you can tell pine siskins is you'll notice there's a little trace of yellow in their wings and there's a little trace of wet yellow down by the base of their tail as well. So siskins will come in and they'll appreciate foods that you have for them. Now, last year, many of you are probably aware that we had what they call a super flight of siskins, meaning that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of siskins left the boreal forests up in Canada and came way further south than their particular range is because all of the seed crop from the conifer trees uh, was very low or failed entirely. And so it was either starve to death and stay where we are or move out into uncharted territory and try to find food. So siskins came in tremendous numbers and were every everyone's feeders and uh, showing up with a disease at feeders. And people started knowing siskins that had swollen eyes, bloated bodies, they seemed lethargic, breathing with lab labored breathing and then dying many of them. So what was going on is that they were exhibiting salmonellosis, 
the, the disease infection you get from salmonella. Now, salmonella is carried in almost all birds. That's why when you buy a chicken from the store, you have to wash it before preparing it because it may have salmonella in it. So all birds are carriers of salmonella or can be, but the actual disease salmonellosis tends to only afflict the older, the weaker, the already injured, or birds that have a, 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 a DNA genetic weakness that makes them more vulnerable. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife was getting all these reports last winter and spring from Siskins turning up ill at feeders. So they issued a blanket recommendation, just take your feeders down and keep them down. Now at my house, I never saw an example of a uh, uh, pine siskin with salmonellosis. And I contacted three different uh, universities um, that had uh, bird pathologists on, on their faculty and asked them what they thought. And their answer was perhaps more nuanced, but I took it to heart and recommended it to people in my area here. And that was, is that, you know, if you don't see any birds exhibiting salmonellosis at your feeder, keep your feeders up and monitor them. If you do see a bird that comes down with salmonellosis, take your feeders down, garbage the seed, dispose of it, wash your feeder in a solution of uh, one part bleach, nine parts water, and then keep it down for at least two weeks to allow these birds to disperse and find other food sources, natural food sources. After a couple of weeks, put the feeder back out. It's nice and clean now. Fresh seed, hopefully from a different, you know, bag of seed than you had before. Put it out and then monitor. And if you don't see any other siskins coming in that look ill, uh, the advice I got was that by keeping all of these birds fed and you know, well full of energy, full of protein during the cold winter months, which are, is a time of hardship for all birds, you're doing more to help the whole bird nation than you are putting some individuals at risk by having uh, the feeder out. Because as I said, almost all birds have salmonella in their system they're carrying. It just tends to be more susceptible birds that succumb to the actual disease. So uh, hopefully we won't have that issue this year but in mentioning pine siskins, I think maybe several of you thought, hey, wasn't there a problem with them? And there was. When you see pine siskins flying, it's amazing though. They expand and contract and swell and swerve. I mean, the blue angels are, are, are super coordinated you know, pilots. I don't think they have anything on pine siskins because they're amazing and they do it you know, by the hundreds. So one of our finches, Now the red breast looks chickadee like, but you'll notice a little difference. It's got a steel blue gray back and flanks. It's got a blue gray cap and it has a black line right through the eye, which we call an eye line. And the line above it is white. So it has a white eyebrow and a very long narrow beak that's great for picking seeds out of seed hulls and for picking insects off trees. Red-breasted nut hatches will come readily to both black oil sunflower and for sure they'll come to suet feeders. This is a, a red-breasted nut hatch just up by the pottery studio I took on a Port Orford cedar and it shows that nut hatches are adept at hanging completely upside down. Remember we saw that uh, foot of the uh, brown creeper, how we have three toes in front and that big black hallux, the big, big toe in the back. Well, nut hatches can do this. They can rotate their third toe so they have two in front and two in back, which allows them to go head first down a tree or hang completely upside down like this nut hatch is as he's poking the, uh, the cones, the strobiles of this poor Orford cedar. It's very fun when you see brown creepers and red-breasted nut hatches together because the creeper will work its way up the tree the red-breasted nuthatch works its way down the tree. When they get to a certain spot, they switch places and do the same thing again. This way, both birds can be working the very same tree for the very same food sources, but not be in direct competition with one another. Because if you're a little bitty creeper going up through these canyons of bark furrows and ridges, your perspective and what you see is much different than if you're a nuthatch doing the same thing working your way down these bark canyons and ridges. 
So they can work the same tree and not be in direct competition. You know, some of the evolutionary strategies that we see are, are pretty astounding. The dark-eyed jungle was going up, everyone referred to as the snowbird. Now they're around all year, but as soon as it starts to get fall and colder and natural food sources start to become uh, less abundant, they will love to come to your feeders. And so everyone in my family would always say, and my family, the whole town I grew up in, oh, the snowbirds are back, the snowbirds are back, meaning that they would congregate in, in large groups at their feeders, or if they didn't have people didn't have a feeder, they'd just be in their garden looking around for any seeds or any small uh, invertebrates that might be in the soil. So the snowbird, the dark-eyed junco, has a black cowl that extends way down around its chest, has a very contrasting pale, almost pinkish white uh, beak, and then the dark eyes, of course, and kind of pinkish tan colored flanks. I don't know why they call this bird a junco. It's a sparrow, and junco is a term for rushes, you know, the aquatic shoreline plants. And this bird has nothing to do with those necessarily, but it's a junco, and we have the dark eyed junco, and the version we have is called the Oregon junco. So if you hear someone say the Oregon junco, it just means the dark eyed junco that we have in our area. And they're nice because if you have a, a tube feeder with seed and any seed that spills, Junkos like to forage off the ground. So rather than fly up and get the seeds out of the tube feeder, which they will do sometimes, they'll clean up any spillage underneath the feeder. So they're ground feeding specialists and they do a good service for you, keeping the ground clean under your feeder and they're feeding themselves at the same time. We have some sparrows that will readily come to your yard if you have feeders which under them. One of them is the golden crown sparrow. Now in the sparrow world, you can divide sparrows into two big groups, sparrows that have a plain breast like the golden crown sparrow and sparrows that have a streaked breast as we'll see a couple birds later when we take a look at the song sparrow. But the golden crown sparrow is aptly named because it's got a yellow stripe right down the center of its head like a football helmet bordered by two black stripes. This is what they look like, the males look like when they're resplendent, resplendent in breeding plumage. But right now, they look more like this, because there's from abrasions, from injury, from attack by insects, and also thermoregulate their body. And feathers take a beating over the course of a year, so birds usually molt twice. They shed all their feathers, not all at once, but a few at a time and grow in new ones. And this time of year, many of the birds have are molting. And so they have a pretty scruffy look. You can see a little bit of the, of the football helmet yellow down the center, but the black is pretty vacant. It's more of a brown. And the whole bird just has kind of a, a weather beaten look. But by the time we get to Halloween, these birds will be back in this kind of plumage and looking dapper and sharp and will love to be in your yard. Another plain breasted sparrow is the white crown sparrow. And I always think this bird looks like it's wearing a bicycle helmet because it's got alternating black and white stripes on the cap with a yellow beak. As with the gold crown sparrow, they'll love to forage in your garden. So I would recommend, you know, if you have plants that die back, just leave them there all winter. Don't be too tidy and clean them up and compost them. Leave them out there because underneath those plants will be all kinds of worms and invertebrates of many kinds and birds like these sparrows will love to pick through that leaf litter and scratch and see if they can find some of these creatures for their protein. So leave your garden over winter a little bit messy, clean it up in the spring. And here's our streak breasted sparrow, the song sparrow. And you can see the song sparrow not only has streaks, but in the center of the breast, the streaks coalesce into a brown patch that look, kind of looks like a brown splotch or a, or a, a ink blot. It has a gray eyebrow. And this bird is interesting because it has a beautiful song and it sings it all year long. For most songbirds, its vocalizations in the form of song are to announce their territory, their little patch of, of forest or, or your yard as their home and tell all the other males to keep their distance and to draw in the females for courtship and mating. Once that's all over, 
for some, most birds, songbirds, there's no need to sing. And in fact, singing is a very high caloric activity. If you've ever watched a bird sing, their whole body's in it. I think it's kind of analogous to, okay, I'm gonna sing a song now. For a human, it's like, I'm gonna go sprint, you know, 200 yards. <laughs> Am I really ready to do that? And wait 10 seconds and do it again. So it's a, a high energy expenditure for birds. So most birds don't do that in the fall and winter. They're just trying to build up their fat reserves to make it through the cold lean times of, of the turn of the season. Not so song sparrows. You'll hear them singing in your yard all fall and all winter. And I call this bird the Beethoven's fifth bird because it tends to have three or four phrases in its song that it almost always starts off with deep, 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 deep. You know, the four notes of the fate knocks at the door motive from the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And it's just great when the days are gray and gloomy and cold to hear a song sparrow out in your yard singing away. I don't know, it really brightens my spirits. So they're great to have a seed feeder if you have suet, or as I mentioned, if you leave your leaf litter and garden a little bit messy over the winter, to them that's like, hey, I know food is lurking underneath those leaves and I'm gonna go scratch around and find it. We also have a non-English sparrow. It's a very pretty bird. It's a beautiful white with a bunch of dark specks on the breast that go up into a line up to its beak, which is dark. And then a beautiful chestnut backed nape that goes down to tan on the wings. These birds love to be in shrubs in uh, urban areas and they make kind of a sharp cheeping sound. Um, and although sometimes people have said they might displace other birds, I have some house uh, sparrows around my house and they seem to just get along just fine with all the other birds. So that's the bird. If it's around, don't feel bad. It's not native bird, but it's not particularly problematic in any way to our native birds. And another sparrow family member, the spotted towhee. This bird at first glance looks a bit like a robin because it's robin sized and it has the beautiful orange breast, but only on the sides. Right down the center, it's white. And the spots, of course, you can see in its wings. It's got black wings with a bunch of white patterns. And then that red eye, is that intense or what? This is a very cool bird that, as we talked about with uh, the juncos and the sparrows, likes to feed on the ground. So it'll clean up any seed spillage from underneath your feeders if you have a tube feeder. Um, it will fly up and get suet out of your suet feeder or if any suet crumbs fall to the ground, it'll clean them up there. And it will be scratching underneath any leaf debris you have in your garden. So again, leaving your garden messy over fall and winter is a great thing for birds. And this is the bird that it's, has a variety of vocalizations, both songs and calls, but its alarm call sounds very much like a cat. And you might be fooled a few times with a toe in your yard when you hear it, meow, meow, thinking, does the neighbors have a cat? I didn't think they had one. And it's the spotted towhee. So a very delightful bird that will come readily to your yard. Gregarious, small little brown birds, kind of gray on the breast, brown on the cap with a long tail. And these birds come in and they love suet. So if you have a suet feeder up, they will come in, you know, by the dozens. And they're the nervous Nellies of the bird world because they'll fly in, they'll be twittering and feeding and constantly looking around. And one will get nervous and think it sees something that could be a danger and it'll fly off and woof, they're all gone. 20 seconds later, woof, they're back again feeding. So they're a lot of fun to watch and um, they love suet and they also love any plants in your yard that go to seed. They will love eating the seeds of them. The varied thrush. This is a cousin of our American robin. In fact, the robin is the American thrush. Looks like robin size, robin shape. But boy, look at that back. This beautiful charcoal with almost a hint of blue to it. And it has the robin red throat and breast, but it's got this beautiful blue bib, a band that goes around the breast. This bird right now is up in the high country. So it's up in the Cascades, up at Snoqualmie Pass, Stevens Pass, White Pass, Blewett Pass, and over in the Olympics. It spends the summer up there for its breeding. But as the days get shorter, the temperature gets colder and we start getting rain and snow starts falling in the mountains, 
The very thrush will migrate elevationally. It will come from the high country back down here and spend the winter with us, November, December, January, February, and early March. They're not particularly seed eaters, but they will go for suet on occasion, but they especially like messy yards. Again, if you can cope with having some dead leaves and litter around in your yard, don't clean it up, wait until spring, and you might draw these birds in looking for a meal underneath that leaf debris. We mentioned the American black wing, the female on the right. They like seed feeders. And although they are around in our area, they are localized, but hey, give it a try. Put some Niger out and you might draw them in. The state bird of Washington, as it is with many states, and they make a delightful call when they're flying. They say potato chip dip, potato chip dip. So a fun bird to have around. And then a special place in my heart, and I think all of our hearts for our Anna's hummingbirds, these guys are just miraculous jewels on the wing. And as I mentioned earlier, they're here year round. We do have a migratory hummingbird called the Rufus. Rufus, when you hear that term used in the bird world, it means orange or red. And the Rufus males are all orange. They're incredible. But they're heading back down to Southern California and Mexico right now. They're one of the earliest mite birds to make the fall migration. So the Annas are still around. They're going to be around. And it's very easy to get a hummingbird feeder, put it up with the uh, nectar method I mentioned earlier, four parts water, one part white sugar, and they will delight you all winter long. And you'll be doing them a great service all winter long. So a tremendous variety of birds that you can draw to your yard with just a little thought to what do birds like? What do they need for nesting? What foods do they like? And what native plants can enhance my yard to draw them in supplemented by feeding stations? Well, if you have questions, this would be a great time. Here we have our uh, great blue herons that were up in the nest rookery, the youngsters waiting for a meal. Some of them are look very intimidating. But hopefully I won't be intimidated by your questions. So if you have some, you can put them in the chat box and Joey will relay them to me and I will do my best to take a stab at giving you an answer. So, so do other birds like Niger or is it just goldfinches? Question is, do other birds like Niger seed or is it just goldfinches? You know, goldfinches are the ones that really like Niger. Any of the finch family, and some sparrows too will go for Niger, but they all go for black oil sunflower. So my recommendation is, is that because the black oil is so attractive to the wide variety of birds and it's so nutritious for them, go for that as your first choice. The Niger is more volatile, as I mentioned, if it dries out, the birds won't wanna have anything to do with it. So you'll have to dump it. Um, and uh, if it stays out for too long, too long, I mean, four, five, six weeks, you're probably going to want to get rid of it anyway. And because the goldfinches are localized in their population in their area, you know, I won't, I won't say don't go for it. You might get lucky and have them coming in and they're just beautiful to see. Um, I'm just a couple miles from where goldfinches like to hang out and I was never able to get, draw them in or draw them in and have them keep coming back. So if you really want to get a goldfinch, Niger's the way to go. But if you want to draw in the greatest variety of birds, black oil sunflower, I recommend. Do Madronas planted on steep slope have a high survivability rate? Question is, do Madronas, if you plant them on steep slopes, have a high survivability rate? Madronas are adapted to grow on steep slopes and rocky, rocky areas with steep topography going down to um, an interesting side note, um, if you live in the Seattle area, you're familiar with the part of town that's called Magnolia, where Discovery Park is. It's kind of a round, was almost an island with a little isthmus of marshland on the west part of Seattle. When Captain George Vancouver first sailed into um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and then in Puget Sound in the HMS Discovery and first explored and mapped the area, when he came around the Magnolia Peninsula, the madrona trees were all in bloom and from the ship, he mistook them for magnolias and named that peninsula Magnolia. It should be called Madrona 
because the only magnolias in Seattle are ones that are planted as ornamentals. So yes, they are very uh, uh, well equipped at perching on steep hillsides and holding the hillsides back. In fact, their tensile strength of their wood is amazing because you can see a madrona tree anchored in the ground, leaning out at a severe angle to reach up with its canopy to get sun and away from other trees. And you know, the weight of the wood and the weight of the water, that's tons of weight in the trunk of that tree is tremendous. And the more you lean it over, the more, the greater the pull of gravity is. You know, I used to ride a motorcycle and I can tell you, if it starts going over, there's a point of no return where you're not gonna have the strength to lift it back up. But madronas can be at, at severe angles and still maintain their purchase. So they're a great, a great native broadleaf tree. Uh, evergreen broadly for hillsides. So Sandra wants to know what plants draw the kind of bugs our little brown bats like to eat? The question is what plants draw insects that our bats like to eat? And uh, we do have a variety of bats here that are great insect feeders. And if you've ever been a little bit leery or wary of bats, here's a figure that will warm your heart. One bat can eat up to 700 mosquitoes in an hour, one bat. That's 700 less that'll be plaguing you. And the bats go for a great variety of insects, flying insects. So they go for moths, midges, gnats, mosquitoes, mayflies, uh, stoneflies, uh, a lot of insects that are flying up off the water. Um, any insect that you have in your yard that's good for birds, if it can fly, when these birds go to bed because they're all diurnal. Then the bats come out and they'll take over. So by day, the swallows are vacuuming the air of bird of insects. They go to bed and in the evening, the bats come out. So any insects you have in your yard that birds like, bats will like too. They just feed at a different time and strictly in the air. Cedar wax wings, are they, are they here all year round? Do they not come to feeders? Question was the bird called a cedar waxwing, which is a very elegant, dapper bird that's got a crest that goes back. He's like he's cochrane ants. <laughs> anyway, cedar waxwings are primarily berry eating birds. And yes, they are here year round. Cedar waxwings are resident birds, and you can hear them all year round. This is the time of year from now, September, October, November, and December, when the berries are ripening, they're going to be feasting on them. And just like the robins, when the sugar in those red and purple berries ferments, uh, the cedar waxwings have their once a year binge and they'll become intoxicated by them. But they're here year round. In addition to berries, they eat insects. They're not a bird that's going to come to a, a feeding station at your house. So if you have suet or you have uh, seed in a tube feeder, you, you won't see a, a cedar waxwing coming by. But if you have an elderberry as a shrub and you have elderberry in your yard, come by for the berries for that. If you have Oregon grape, if you have salal, they're gonna come for that. If you have um, a plant called viburnum edulae, high bush cranberry that has red berries, beautiful shrub, lots of white color from the flowers in the spring, red crimson red berries that are, that are getting red right now, you'll have wax wings. So anything with a berry on it, the wax wings will be coming around. And they're a beautiful bird. I, I just love them. Are you concerned about bird feeders altering bird migration patterns in feeders' ways? Question is, is there a need to be concerned about bird feeders alter, altering birds' migration habits? And the answer is absolutely not. Migration is something that's hardwired into birds' DNA. And it has been for you know, thousands and thousands of years, millennia. And the things that trigger a bird to migrate tend to be the length of photo period, our days are getting shorter, that triggers hibernation mechanisms. Temperature change, the weather's getting colder, that starts to trigger the, hibern uh, the uh, migration mechanisms. Um, lack of food, our insect population, you know, it's peaking and booming through June, July, August, September, October, the insects have hatched, Many of them have been eaten. There's not as many around. So the need for food triggers the migration urge. Having a bird feeder up is not going to delay or dissuade or alter the behavior in any way, shape, or form. And studies have been done on that. 
Um, the urge to migrate is too hardwired and related to too many other powerful motivators. A bird feeder in your yard isn't going to affect that in any way at all. So no need to worry about your feeders doing harm to birds and keeping them here when they need to go south. Good question. The bird feeders that don't attract rats. <laughs> question is, are there bird feeders that don't attract rats? And the answer is no. If you have a bird feeder up, if there's any spillage, you're gonna have rats. And so I like to tell people that in Seattle, as in most every city in North America, we are awash in European rats, non-native rats. Uh, the Norway rat, Rattus norvegicus is a big one. The black rat or roof rat, Rattus ratus is its scientific name. It's the double rat. Are all shipboard stowaways that even today when ships container ships come into port at Port of Seattle, Port of Tacoma, wherever it may be, and they start unloading cargo, rats start jumping off the ship. So they're everywhere. Um, the best thing you can do is keep them out of your house. They're in my backyard, they're in your backyard, they come out in the evening. They're so common running in the fences between my neighbor's yards and my yard that we refer to them as night squirrels because it's better than uh, another Norway rat. Keep them out of your house, but you're just gonna have to tolerate them being in your yard. That being said, they're there anyway. So if you have bird feeders up, yeah, the rats might come along and wanna eat some of that spillage, but you're doing so much good for the bird nation by keeping them fed, healthy and strong that um, if you can tolerate putting up with a, a rat or two, it's worth it. Um, if, the, if rats just absolutely make your skin crawl, then I would suggest take your feeders in for a couple of weeks. Um, the rats not finding any you know, feed around in your yard are gonna go somewhere else to look for food. When they've gone and found something else, after a couple of weeks, put your feeder back out and you may end up having to put it out, put it back, bring it in, put it back out. But that's the best way to, to coexist with rats because they're not going away. And just as a little aside, you you can always identify an invasive European rat because they have no fur on their tails. They have what we call a scaly tail. All of our native rats and mice have furred tails. And we do have rats and mice that are native. Um, but if it's got a hairless tail, it's one of these European uh, stowaways. And there's not much we can do about them. So I have my feeders out. And I know I just have to tolerate some rats in the yard. Um, but I just make sure my house is totally sealed. There's no openings, no, no gaps nowhere where a rat can get into the house. And I have to call it good. Just have to, just have to live with them. What plants can we have on our porch to attract birds all year? So what plants can you have on your porch to attract birds all year? Well, you know, hummingbirds love fuchsias and fuchsias are beautiful and there's a great variety of them. Um, Right near where I live is a, a great native plant store that has native and non-native plants called City Peoples on Madison. And you can get a variety of plants there that hummingbirds will love. And fuchsias are one of them. Um, some members of the honeysuckle family are also very good. Salvias, hummingbirds love salvias. So, you know, you can have some potted plants like that that will add color to your deck, will draw hummingbirds in, and they're, they're great to watch. They may not all be native, but remember I said that natives are important for the reasons I mentioned, but that doesn't mean you can't have beautiful, you know, non-native plants that will add color to your home and be a great food source for birds too. So small potted plants, and they don't have to be native, will, will do a lot for, for birds at your house if you can't put a feeder up. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties we had this evening. Um, an hour before our program began, Ed's uh, computer crashed, and the uh, only other computer was a bit old and, and wasn't quite up to snuff, but um, hopefully we can get that replaced and be a little bit better the next time we're around. And a big thanks to Joey Manson for doing all the technical follow-up and, and getting it to work. So as well, I like to say, technology, making life easier, right? Most of the time. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me this evening. I hope this gives you some good information about birds and plants and how to get them into your yard. And one thing I can guarantee you, you will derive a lot of satisfaction watching the birds and their behaviors and their feeding and the color and beauty they bring to your yard. 
Thank you very much and come down and see us at Seward Park Audubon.